So welcome to you all at the Paris School of Economics and uh, World Inequality Lab. So my job is just to give the floor to Stephanie. Let me simply say that uh, uh, this conference, as Facundo said, uh, would not have been possible without uh, Flaviana at Ekinec, without all the people here at the World Inequality Lab, and without Facundo himself, who is uh, very uh, modest, but who does a lot of work to develop collective projects. He did that in the past to develop our World Top Income Database, and the organization of this conference has relied so much on, on Facundo. So thanks a lot, uh, Facundo. <laughs> Um, my my uh, first job and actually my main job as a president uh, elect of the uh, society for the measurement of economic inequality was to pick two uh, key not uh, lecturers and I was very glad and, uh, that uh, Stephanie and Marianne accepted to be the two lecturers for this year. Stephanie and Marianne are very impressive and productive researchers. It's incredible how much they have achieved in so little. Stephanie belongs to this rare group of researchers in the field of inequality and public economics, combining uh, theoretical work, empirical work. So today is going to be, I think, mostly empirical, but Stephanie has also incredible uh, theoretical skills. Uh, and uh, I think this is very important, you know, in our society, in our meetings, to combine, of course, uh, theoretical and empirical approaches rather than, you know, division of labor between two groups of people. So Stephanie is the perfect person to embody this, and so I'm very glad, Stephanie, to give you the floor. So you will give this lecture. We'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end, but I think most of all we are here to hear for, for you know, what you have to say. So Stephanie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Thomas, for this very generous introduction. Thank you, Facundo. Thank you all for the invitation. And since you spoke about colors, the colors don't mean the same in the US as in France. Um, so just, just to point that out. Okay, so uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about a project that is about immigration and redistribution. Uh, it's joint work with Alberto Alesina, my colleague at Harvard, and Armando Miano, one of our grad students at Harvard. And what we try to uh, do in this project is to think about how the recent elections and all the debate about immigration has perhaps shaped not just views on immigration, but actually views on redistribution policies, progressive taxes, social insurance, transfers, etc. And the underlying, if you want, theory behind this is that people have noted time and time again that generosity travels perhaps less well across ethnic, religious, and national lines than it does within. So is that true? What is the link between uh, immigration and actually perceptions of immigration and support for redistribution? So we really try to study two broad questions. One is, since really what matters is in the sense what people know or perceive, how do people actually perceive or misperceive immigration? Uh, are the perceptions of immigration about many characteristics of it, like the number, the origin, the unemployment, education, poverty, reliance on government transfers, etc., are they actually correct, in line with reality, very far off, etc.? Uh, and then, what what are the heterogeneities here? Uh, does it matter how educated you are, how much you earn, where you work, etc.? And then, what is the link? perhaps first correlation-wise and then causally between these views about immigrants and uh, the support for redistribution. Given that the perceptions are perhaps not in line with reality, does providing information help? Uh, does changing anything about the views help? So what do we do? Well, we employ a method that I've been trying to push forward as much as possible in the last few years, which is to do large-scale surveys, uh, which are basically a tool to understand what people know think, perceive. Uh, so we do these large-scale surveys in six countries, so France is one of them, uh, Germany, Italy, Sweden, the UK, and the US, for a total of more than 20, 22,500 respondents. So the way these surveys are done, I'll give you way more detail about the actual setup, they're run, they're designed by us, every question, every interactive feature, every color, and then they're diffused and actually implemented by commercial survey companies who have access to large samples. Uh, typically for commercial purposes, um, you know, they can be representative, they can be targeting specific groups. In this case, we want to be representative of the population in each of these countries, and so we target broad representative populations. Um, the survey components that appear are always very similar. There will be some variation, and I'll walk you through more details here. But first, you start asking people about their background information, their income, their education, political views, etc. 
Then comes a big blog where we ask people about their perceptions of immigrants along all these dimensions, like number, origin, religion, economic circumstances, etc. Then come questions about their views on policy, how much taxes people would like to have, how much transfers, etc. Uh, and then in the middle of these, uh, of these blocks come treatments in a randomized way. Uh, so some respondents will see nothing, some respondents will see one of these branches. And what are they? Well, there's three types of treatment here. The first is just a priming treatment. The only thing we're going to do is to invert the order in which we ask redistribution questions and immigration questions. Uh, so people who are asked immigration questions first are going to just be made to think about immigration before they ask policy questions without any information, just taking all their perceptions or misperceptions as given. The second type of treatment is information, like factual treatments, and we're going to talk about the number of immigrants, telling people the true number of immigrants in their country and the origin of those immigrants, truly. And then the third is an anecdote, so a third type of treatment, which is just talking about a very hardworking, kind of exemplary immigrant, uh, you know, that is there working very hard, not relying on government at all, kind of a best case scenario immigrant, if you want, uh, and see what that, what that does to people's views. And so there's two big sets of findings here, very much related to the two big questions. The first is that you will see perceptions of immigration are substantially and systematically very, very wrong. Uh, you're you can have one of two gut reactions here. One gut reaction people often have is, yeah, I mean, people are wrong about lots of things. Um, so here what will be different is how systematically wrong they are across countries, across respondent types, and also the contrast to their views about natives, which is, uh, which is different. The second big reaction people sometimes have is, um, well, you know, yeah, people are wrong, but I would be right, and clearly people are just not educated. And so I encourage you when before I show the graphs to think what would be the number of unemployed immigrants what do I know what is the number of Muslim immigrants what is the share of immigrants overall try to think and see if you're surprised perhaps by your own uh, by your own answers to these questions so in, across all countries people starkly uh, overestimate the number of immigrants the share of immigrants uh, the share of Muslim immigrants and correspondingly really underestimate the share of Christian immigrants. And I'm picking on those two uh, religions because Christian is the majority religion in all these countries that we surveyed. Would be very interesting to do this in a non-Christian majority country to see how it differs. Um, they underestimate the immigrants' education, employment, contribution to the welfare state. And people are wrong about natives too. So people are wrong about many things for sure. That's true. But they're much more wrong in acting in a systematic way about immigrants. There's larger misperceptions for some groups, although everyone's wrong on average. Some groups are more wrong than others. And basically people who work in low skill jobs in immigration intensive sectors uh, are those who have the largest misperceptions about immigrants. So contrast this to like a high skilled immigrant intensive sector like Silicon Valley type jobs where there are a lot of immigrants, but it's high skill and there people have lower misperceptions. People without college, uh, people, actually women are more wrong and when I say more wrong here, in general, it will mean always more negative about immigrants. Uh, and then right-wing respondents, so people on the right of the political spectrum, are also have larger misperceptions about immigrants. Okay. And then um, another main, main finding, more about the effects of information or of the treatments, is that just making people think about immigrants, so this order treatment where you ask people questions about immigrants before asking a redistribution question, is going to actually generate a negative reaction in terms of your support for redistribution. So perhaps mimicking a little bit of political debate, uh, if you talk about immigration, given the baseline negative misperception views, you may not just shift views on immigration, you may also shift views on redistribution, perhaps in unintended ways. Just showing factual information on the sheer and origin really has no effect uh, on policy views. Uh, it, it does shift a little bit the actual perception, so people do believe the information, but that per se is not somehow enough to overcome the the, all the misperceptions. And then the anecdote works some, somewhat, so showing a hardworking immigrant generates some more support for distribution, but again, it's cancelled out if you first make people think in detail about the characteristics of immigrants. So all these treatments overlay so we can look at their interaction, and basically just making people think in detail about immigrants swamps any positive effect you may get from the anecdote. Okay, there's a lot of related literature, including by people in the room, so, um, you know, a lot of 
documentation and other surveys, existing surveys about the perceptions of immigrants, the link sometimes quasi-experimentally with natural experiments uh, about immigration and redistribution, for instance, refugees being assigned uh, to some cities, not to others, um, some very good work on that. There is a lot of uh, a lot of work on information experiments that's growing over time, not necessarily about immigration, but other topics and redistribution. And so this really fits into that literature too. I would say our contributions here are really to do this cross-country, large-scale and kind of standardized survey plus experiment to elicit these detailed perceptions, not just about the share of immigrants, but also about their economic circumstances, their other characteristics. And let me note that just the share of immigrants actually if you just look at the correlational sense, it doesn't, first, it doesn't differ, for instance, by left and right wing, both are equally wrong. And then it doesn't really correlate much with views of redistribution. But the perceived composition of those immigrants in terms of religion, economic power, differs a lot by political view, and then also is very correlated with views of for redistribution. So I think there's, uh, there's all these different contributions here relative to that already very large literature. Okay, so let me tell you about how we collect the data uh, through these surveys and what sorts of experiments we run in more detail. Okay, so in more detail, a survey structure would look like this. Um, first come background questions about people's socioeconomic conditions, job sector, immigrant, whether your parents were immigrants, political views, a lot of detailed questions. Why do you ask those first? Well, you ask those first because people are happy to, you know, people are free to take the survey or not. So when they get sent out the invitation per email, they don't know the topic of the survey. They just know it's some academic survey, so they know it's not about shampoo necessarily, uh, and they know it's not from a company or from a political party, but they don't know the topic. Once they click on the link, there's a consent page, and then they get asked questions about themselves, and only then they get asked other questions about some topics. So what's nice here is that if people decide, I hate the immigration topic, I'm not going to answer a survey about it, they've already answered the questions about themselves. So if they drop out, we can check who drops out. Is it, you know, differentially uh, between different, for instance, political views between different out incomes? So it's important to know this uh, before going to the more, you know, content important questions. So that's why we ask those first. And I can tell you there's no differential attrition. So once people get into the survey, they're equally likely to complete it, whether left and right wing, rich or poor, etc. Of course, there may be some initial selection into who goes into taking surveys, and that's why you know we try to target a representative sample along age, income, uh, regions in the country, and gender. Um, of course, very high income people will not take surveys. That's true for any survey, not just online survey. Uh, very poor people also will not take online surveys. So you can think about the population that's targeted here, but still broadly quite representative. After this block come the actual treatments. As I said, um, I'll call treatment one the information on the number, treatment two information on the origin, treatment three the anecdote on hard work. And then come these two big blocks of questions, the order of which will be randomized. The immigration block asks about the detailed perceptions of immigrants, and then also about immigration policies. And here we try to be a bit more creative, so not just you think there's too much immigration, yes or no, but also, you know, how, of, how soon should immigrants be allowed to apply for citizenship? Uh, how soon should they be eligible for benefits? Perhaps someone is, you know, happy to let immigrants in as long as they're not eligible for benefits. Maybe that's the problem. Or maybe someone thinks, no, immigrants should just not be allowed ever to become citizens. Let's see what people think. And then also another question, which is when do you truly consider an immigrant to become, you know, here I say American, but truly French, you know, uh, soon, later, never, uh, etc. And then come the redistribution block, which asks uh, the questions about redistributive policies, mostly income support policies, income taxes, uh, how to spend the budget of the government, and also a question on a donation. Uh, I'll show it to you in detail, because, you know, you can, what we see actually is like, private charity is kind of the more right-wing way of redistributing. And so that will have an effect, for instance, uh, for some right-wing respondents as opposed to general taxation. And then questions on the role of government to see whether people actually think the government should intervene at all. Does it have the tools to intervene at all? Does, is it benevolent enough, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, a bit more detail about how we elicit the views on immigrants. So a lot of work and thought goes into how to design these questions because you could just ask, what percent of the population is immigrant? But what the problem is, is that you would really like people to understand whoever is not an immigrant, 
uh, whoever is an immigrant, all this has to sum up to a given level. Does it look reasonable to you what you're answering or not? So one good way that we found is this sort of slider plus pie chart design, which basically the slider starts all at, at zero and the, the pie chart is all gray. As soon as people start moving the, the slider, the pie chart becomes colored and the blue is US born and the red is foreign born. So I should say the definition of immigrant here is foreign born. Uh, it's to avoid issues about you know citizenship, which differ by country, residency, etc. So it's really who's not born in the country. That's the OECD, one of the OECD main definitions of immigrants. Um, so people can select move the slider and then they can see does it look reasonable on the pie chart? Do I really think that many are immigrants or not? Note that putting the slider at zero kind of biases people towards low numbers. In fact, there's going to be a huge overestimation. They are really moving the slider. Um, another good thing about the slider is that it it uh, you know it avoids like round round number digit. You know you have to really try hard to put the slider at exactly 20 or exactly 30. It's not very natural. You may as well put at 21, 22, 23. So there's no implicit round number bias that may occur in general. So this is about the share of immigrants. So what about the origin? Well, it's an extended design of this. Now it's out of 100 people who are immigrants. The pie chart is all immigrants. Where do they come from? So each region of the world is in one color. In fact, it's cut from the slide. But at the top, there's a map of the world. And the regions are marked in each of these colors. It's to avoid debates about, you know, is uh, Spain in Europe or is <laughs> Bulgaria in Europe? Um, so. <laughs> I picked very random examples. Um, but so people, people see the regions, people see the regions and, uh, and, and can select with, again, the sliders, how many, how many immigrants come from that region. It has to add up to 100 again. So it's a more complicated pie chart. In fact, the question itself is very complicated, right? Where do the immigrants come from? But this allows people to you know, go back, try as many times as they want, see if the pie chart to them looks as it should, and you know, gives, a, gives, a, gives a good uh, way that, to intuitively give an answer to this question. OK. We have a range of other questions asking about you know, do you think an immigrant is rich because they worked hard or mostly because of circumstances? Same for being poor. That question is a question that's been asked a lot in like the general social survey for the general population. So we adapt it here to immigrants and we can see the differences, how people answer for natives versus immigrants. Um, a lot of questions about the economic conditions. Again, always asking about natives to have some benchmark and about immigrants. So for instance, out of every 100 people born in the US, how many are currently unemployed? And out of 100 people who are, you know, among immigrants, legal immigrants, how many are currently unemployed, same for poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Another question which uh, I would say is fun, except the answers are, I would say, pretty sad, is to say, imagine two people who are identical. Uh, so we're going to call them John and Mohammed, and we actually randomize the name. So sometimes it's Miguel, sometimes it's Jack. Uh, so the names are obviously different sounding currently living in the US, everybody's the same, has the same income, same family composition, etc. works the same. Uh, who do you think pays more taxes? Is it John or Mohammed? Who do you think gets more transfers? Is it John or Mohammed? Again, the name gets randomized. And so we'll see what people think about that. The questions on policies, it's important here to do them a bit carefully. Because if you just say, would you like more education for poor kids, people will say yes, uh, as you know, I hope all of us would, uh, until you know you actually try to make people understand that there is some budget constraint. So you would like to impose some budget constraint, not that people just say, uh, I want more of this and I want more of this. So to impose some discipline, what we do is to split the questions into basically three. One is, what is the overall involvement you would like from government and intervention in, re in redistribution? Basically, what would you like the size of intervention government to be? Second, now that we've established this, how would you share a given tax burden across different groups? So say we need to raise 100% of a given revenue, how would you allocate it among different groups? Who should bear the burden? And three, given that we have 100% of the budget to spend, how would you spend it for different categories like defense, security, um, you know, social insurance programs, health, education, etc. Okay? And so um, the final kind of policy question is a question on donations. Would you like to donate? It's also a real outcome. So how do we do this? Well, we tell people that by taking the survey, they're automatically enrolled in a lottery that gives them 
a thousand dollars okay so it's a substantial amount or a thousand euros um it's in order to make this really uh you know a valid question to for people to think how much would they like to donate they don't know if they've won they will know at the end of the survey but they have to commit now how much of that money they want to donate if any to each of these charities okay and so they have to commit now this will be binding they may donate zero so this is a way to see who is or is not more redistributive, especially through private charity. Okay, and so the, the charities are picked to be, you know, well-known, um, relatively neutral. Like, we try not to go into religious charities, although I have to say in some countries it's hard to find so many well-known, not religious charities. Um, and they're supposed to target low-income people in general. They're not immigrant-oriented by any means, okay? So you can check for your country, uh, whether you know these charities and you know to check that they're not pro-immigrant, anti-immigrant. They're just not about immigrants. It's about low-income people. Okay. A final thing I want to tell you is why should we believe the answers or why does it make sense to ask them this way? So I hope with a little bit of the design, I give you some thoughts about how to design the questions carefully, uh, why it's important to have a visual representation to ensure reasonable answers. But there's other things we do to try and elicit you know, reasonable answers from people. Of course, the survey is entirely voluntary. Once they go to the consent page, we ask them, I hope this, whoops, sorry. This was not great. Ugh, one second, I'll re readjust this, great. Um, so once we go to the consent page, people are, you know, first said, okay, it's voluntary, you don't need to take it, but this is really for research and it's important for us if you do choose to take it that you answer and honestly and accurately to the best of your knowledge. So we appeal to their kind of social responsibility. At the same time, a few paragraphs down, we also like show a bit the stick, not just the carrot, and we say, you know, but careless answers will be flagged using sophisticated statistical methods, <laughs> which is true, it is sophisticated. Um, I'm actually not kidding, like you can check things like on the same page do people tend to give always the middle answer for instance, or like uh, does it matter in what order you give the answer options, it shouldn't, right, etc. So we do, we do make those checks exposed, I won't waste much of your time, what we do basically is to replicate all the results on a very conservative sample in the sense that as soon as there's any such flag in the carelessness of answers, we drop the respondent, um, and then we can check whether the results hold the same, so yes they do, uh, but we try to, we, we really try to flag these answers. Um, there's also a, a possibility, that's the beauty also of online surveys, is you can track everything people do. And so you can see how long they spend on each page, how many times they click, do they try to adjust the slider several times, etc. So this is good. It allows us, for instance, to see if someone spent way too little time to really understand the question or on the survey overall. Again, this is one of the robustness checks to drop people who spend too little time. We also ask for feedback exposed, and that feedback is actually very nice. I, 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 I love reading those open-ended answers about the feedback. First gives you some ideas for, for future research. Uh, and now I'm actually doing some text analysis on open-ended questions and surveys, which I find very illuminating. What people think about is not necessarily what economists think about uh, to a first order. And especially we ask whether they feel the survey is biased, left-wing or right-wing, for instance, to see if something annoyed them in the survey. So 16% of people say the survey is biased one way or the other. Believe it or not, it's equally between left-wing and right-wing, which was, I was very happy about. Um, so another thing, as I, saw, as I showed you, is kind of the careful design of the questions themselves to make sure things add up to 100, that uh, things are visual, etc. In addition, one thing we did ex post, uh, because you know, we were asked several times, yeah, but you don't incentivize people to give the right answers. Why would they give the right answers, etc.? So what we do is to run a big follow-up actually in the US where we do incentivize correct answers. So we give a reward, financial reward, for people who give uh, accurate answers to the perception questions about immigrants. Do you know the unemployment rate of immigrants? And one thing to note is that the actual numbers, it took us quite a while to find the actual numbers carefully for all the countries and all immigrants. And so, you know, that data is now online, but it's very hard to find that data if you Google. So we can also, again, spend how, see how much time people spend. But the bottom line is providing financial incentives does not change the answers much at all. So there's really no noticeable effect, which suggests... And by the way, the answers were pretty big. Uh, the rewards were pretty big sometimes, like you know, up to ten dollars uh, to get an extra to get the answers correct. So they were sizable. Still, 
you know, people don't really uh, don't really answer differently, which suggests there's truly a lack, perhaps, of knowledge. It's not a pure carelessness or a pure partisanship to say one thing or the other. Okay. Um, I'll now tell you a little bit about the actual perceptions of immigrants that come out of this hopefully carefully designed survey. And hopefully now that you have some confidence in how the results were elicited. So what do people know and think about immigrants? Okay. So here is the perceived versus the actual number of immigrants by country. And I'll show you next by respondent characteristics. So the blue... Uh, diamonds is the actual share of immigrants in each of these countries, and the red uh, square is the average perception, the mean uh, in those countries. So the first thing to note is that we're talking about legal immigrants throughout. It's not an issue in Europe. It's really tiny, tiny illegal immigration, but in the U.S. it's up to 3.5% uh, of the population. So it is a concern. So here the number plotted for the U.S. is the legal immigrants, and that's how the question is asked. But Illegal would be 13.5%, according to the most generous estimates, so it would still not close the gap by any means. And so you can see that the actual share of immigrants is much, much lower than what people think. Uh, funnily, you know, the, the actual share of immigrants is largest in Sweden here, uh, and that's where also people have the lowest misperception. So they're quite, they're more aware. They're, they're a bit off, but they're more aware. In the U.S., people are extremely much off. Um, in France, Germany, Italy, people are quite off as well. You can say, okay, uh, what about second-generation immigrants? You're asking about foreign-born, but, you know, how do I know exactly? I may be mixing two generations. If you add second-generation immigrants uh, to this graph, it would still not close this gigantic gap. Um, the gap is simply very, very large. So you would have to go, and we don't have data on that, to be honest, um, for all the countries, you would probably have to go to third, fourth generation immigrants, at which point, you know, it begs the question, at what point you stop considering people, you know, immigrants, and actually consider them part of the country. Uh, the other thing is that, um, right, the median, uh, the median misperception, so in the paper, there's a whole table reporting the 25th percentile, the median, the, just to know, is it just outliers, you know, dr driven by the outliers? The median is actually not far from the mean. So you would have to go down to the 20th percentile of the perception to hit the accurate number of immigrants, okay? So some people are, wrong, uh, are right, uh, but it's really a very, very small share of people, Okay. How does it differ by respondent characteristics? So you may say, okay, obviously educated people will not make those mistakes. But in fact, you know, here to make this graph more readable, uh, the x-axis is now misperceptions. Okay, so it's um, immediately normalized by the reality in each country. Okay, so the smallest misperception in the share of immigrants is basically uh, 15 percentage points, okay, across all countries, pooling all the countries uh, and putting the characteristics um, of, of, of respondents on the, on the vertical axis. So if you start at the top, it's actually the, the hardest to read label, but the top is not high immigration sector, so someone who doesn't work in an immigration intensive sector. That's the average misperception for people with that characteristic. Then people who work in a high immigration sector who have no college education, so like a low skil lower skilled high, sec high immigration sector. High immigration sector, but high skilled, so with college then simply cut by college, no college, then simply cut by low income, high income, someone who has an immigrant parent or no immigrant parent, young and old. Let me not say what the age cutoff is. Initially, Armando was like, oh yeah, old is above 30. I was like, <laughs> we're changing that immediately. Um, I don't know what it is now exactly, and I should not put young and old, but young and less young. Uh, male and female, right wing, left wing. Okay, so what you can see is that people who work in high immigration sectors with, uh, l with low skilled jobs have a larger misperception. People who don't have college have a larger misperception, but it's not like people with college are accurate by any means. Uh, people who are young are actually more negative in general about immigrants um, in, 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 this, in the sense that they think there's too many, that they're economically weaker. But then look at left wing, right wing. They're really on top of each other. There's no difference in the sheer of immigrants perceived. And that I already alluded to, it will be really in the composition uh, perceived of immigrants that there's a difference between left and right wing. Okay, so let's go to the composition. So here's the perceived versus actual sheer of Muslim immigrants uh, in, these, in these countries. So again, people really overestimate the sheer of Muslim immigrants. Uh, it's in the US, for instance, 10% of all immigrants 
are Muslim and people think it's closer to 24%. Um, you can see at the bottom one country which is an exception here and that's France actually. So in France, People think they're 50 per so people really think there are a lot of Muslim immigrants, 50 percent. Uh, it's it's the most, you know, from all the countries. But in fact, in France, this is true. Uh, so this is the composition of immigrants because of the colonial past, etc. Is this way in France? So France is not inaccurate along that dimension. What about again the characteristics? Well, it's pretty much the same as before. Who whoever misperceives the share of immigrants more also misperceives the share of Muslim immigrants. But now you can see at the very bottom, the left-wing, right-wing gap, here there is a gap. So contrary to the same perceived share of immigrants, now you see that right-wing respondents tend to overestimate the share of Muslim respondents more than left-wing respondents do. And again, that's systematic across all the countries. Okay. Okay. What about the, the other aspect, which is the share of Christian immigrants? Well, by now you're used to these large misperceptions, but the misperception is really gigantic. So if, if, if you look at what people think about the share of immigrants who are Christian, it's gigantically wrong. So uh, here the numbers are completely inverted, so it's everybody underestimates the share of Christian immigrants. Look at the UK, for instance. In the UK, 30%, people think 30% of all immigrants are Christian. And in fact, it's, it's you know, 55%. Uh, so it's really a very large misperception. Same in Sweden, actually, France, Germany, etc. Okay, so this is true everywhere. And again, you can see all the misperceptions being shifted for all respondent groups, really to the to the left, towards the negative numbers, very large negative numbers. And then you can see a gap between left and wing. Again, educated, not educated, including the immigration sector you work in, uh, the sector you work in, whether it's immigration intensive or not. So these things really shape your views, or at least are very correlated with your views about immigrants. Okay, I'll show you a bunch more. And one thing which I want to show you is a benchmarking with natives. So note that these questions are naturally benchmarked because of the way the slider works. You can see, um, you know, whoever is not an immigrant is uh, is is basically not an immigrant. You can see it on the pie chart. It has to add up to 100. So people who see whoever I say is an immigrant, the others are not. So that's naturally benchmarked if you want against natives. Same for the origin or the religion since they have to assign 100% of immigrants to something. Now, the other questions like what share of immigrants is high educated or what share of natives is not high educated, we need to benchmark it against natives to see what's going, what's going on here. So these questions, since they're not naturally benchmarked, I want to show you the misperception for natives and the misperception for immigrants. Okay, and you can see people are quite wrong about natives too, but it kind of systematically goes in another direction. So the left graph shows you by country again, this time pay attention just to the colors because they're slightly different. So the blue is now the misperception, average misperception in that country about natives, people who are born in that country. And in red is the average misperception about foreign born immigrants. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, in general, people are, you know, always thinking that immigrants are less highly educated than natives in all the countries. Uh, sometimes the misperception is actually smaller for natives in the sense that they tend to overestimate in general, how highly educated natives are, and then they adjust down for immigrants, so they end up being kind of accurate for immigrants, but just be totally over-optimistic about the natives who are uh, highly educated. So the point is that they have a more negative view about, uh, about the immigrants, it goes in the opposite direction of misperception than about the natives. It's very visit on, visible on the right graph, where we show the misperception, again, green here is natives, uh, green here is immigrants, blue is natives, by these different respondent groups. And you can see for everyone, the, the, the green squares are to the left. So everyone thinks natives are, immigrants are less highly educated. Um, and again, it's a gap towards reality. So people tend to underestimate the share of highly educated natives and overestimate the share of highly educated uh, immigrants, sorry, and overestimate the share of highly educated natives. Uh, and you can see the gap between left wing and right wing here too. Uh, it's it's really it's really uh, it's really striking. It's not there for natives at all. Both tend to overestimate slightly by 10 percentage point the share of highly educated natives, but right wing respondents have a more negative view about immigrants than left wing respondents. So they're on top of each other when it comes to thinking about natives. There's a gap that appears when it comes to thinking about immigrants. So I could show you several more such graphs about low educated poverty, unemployment. 
Let me switch to the reliance on government transfers, which is which is also interesting. So here we plot the share of respondents who believe that the average immigrant gets at least twice the amount of transfers from natives. Okay. So this is, of course, a little bit hard to evaluate even in the data. So the OECD has some numbers on this, trying to combine all social insurance spending, all social programs, and try to say this is what goes to an immigrant, this is what goes to an average native. Of course, it's a slightly abstract question. So what we plot is just, do people think immigrants get twice as much or at least twice as much? This is not true in any country. Okay, so this is already a wrong, uh, you know, a wrong perception, but it's just interesting to see in the different countries how many people think so, which is, you know, a really stark overestimation. And you can see that France is not doing very well here. Um, so, you know, 25% of people think immigrants get at least twice as, mu as much transfers as, as natives. Uh, the U.S. is a bit more positive. Germany is actually more positive. Sweden and Italy are also not, not very, very positive. And here on the right, pay attention to the gap between left and right wing. So here is really where a huge gap appears. Uh, right wing respondents are much, much more likely to say the average immigrant gets twice, at least twice the amount of transfers than the average native, than left wing respondents. And in fact, most differences here are really amplified between college and not college educated, uh, etc. So that really seems to be uh, a salient feature in people's minds. And then I want to show you this, I call it here on the slide a bias question, which is, does Mohammed get more transfers and pay less taxes, all else equal, basically? You know, why should he be paying more uh, taxes or less taxes? No reason, really. But what Shia respondents say, oh, yes, Mohammed definitely pays less taxes and gets more transfers than John. In the U.S., 25% of actually, yeah, 25 of respondents uh, say this. Again, France and Italy are not don't look exemplary here. So, 35% uh, uh, of respondents in France and Italy say yes. Mohammed pays less taxes and gets more transfers than John. I told you we randomized the name. So it would be adapted to have like a, another origin sounding name in, in, in Europe, it would be in Western Europe, it would be an Eastern European sounding name, uh, like Stancheva, uh, <laughs> first name. Uh, and in the US, it would be a, a Latin sounding name. And then there would be a very like native sounding name, like Jack, uh, you know, Pierre, whatever. So that we say it's an immigrant, but you could think from some, you know, very close by country. And that makes some difference. So people are most negative about uh, Muslim immigrants, but it makes a difference per se to say someone is an immigrant. So there's already a gap if you just say that person is an immigrant, the name only contributes to it. Okay. Um, the final thing I would like to show you is, okay, well, is it immigrants' fault or not? Why, why are immigrants, given that they're considered so poor and weak, is it their fault? So there's this famous question in the general social survey that says, uh, if someone is poor, is it mostly the result of bad luck or is it their own lack of effort? And if someone is rich, is it mostly the result of their own effort or is it, you know, advantageous circumstances in life? So this effort versus luck question for rich and poor. So we also asked it in past surveys. Uh, we did not have Germany, so you see Germany is a, is a lonely point here. But we also asked it in other surveys where we had these other countries about the population in general, not about immigrants. And in this survey, we asked it about immigrants. So we can compare across these two samples, what is the average response for immigrants, what's the average response for everyone? And on the, on the left is the graph, uh, you know, do you think immigrants are poor because they don't put in the effort, they're just lazy? And so actually, people tend to vary a little bit across countries in whether they tend to think conditional on being poor is a native lazy, conditional on being poor is an immigrant lazy. They tend to vary a little bit. So in the UK and Sweden, it's really interesting. It's exactly the same share who say, and it's from two different samples, okay? It's exactly the same share who will t say someone is poor because of lack of effort, whether you ask about immigrants or natives. In the US, people tend to think actually immigrants are less lazy like, if they're poor, it's a bit less their fault than if an American person is poor. In Italy, it's, sw it's switched, so people tend to think natives, it's really not their fault if they're poor. So note the number, by the way, like, only 12% of people will say a poor Italian is poor because of lack of effort. And 30% will say a poor immigrant is poor because of lack of effort. In France, it's also reversed, as in, like, people think natives you know, cut more slack to natives than to immigrants. Again, we don't have the data for Germany. Now look at the right graph, which tells you 
Condition on being rich, was it mostly your own effort? Did you work hard or not? And so this is showing the share who say, to be rich, you worked hard. And so the red is for immigrants. So in all countries, people say, okay, if you are an immigrant that became rich, then you worked very hard. People understand that in all the countries. And they tend to say that much more for immigrants than for natives. Again, look at France and Italy. It sounds like the system is stacked against people in general, in people's minds, as in, even if you work hard, you won't make it to be rich. Uh, that's there in the perception for natives. But even there, people say, okay, if you made it to be rich as an immigrant, and by the way, people don't think there are many rich immigrants, right? That, that's what we showed before. They're not educated, they're poor, they're unemployed. But condition on making it rich, you must have worked hard, okay? So that's the question. So I find this interesting, this difference between poor and rich and immigrants and natives. Okay. All right. Um, here I just put some notes on these robustness checks, but I already told you about it, like even dropping careless answers along with these sophisticated statistical techniques uh, does not really change the results. It's not that these are outliers. It's not that these are, you know, uh, completely careless answers. And then I told you that just giving an incentive for correct answers doesn't change this picture much at all. So clearly, there is some wrong views which are here. Okay. Now, another thing which we do, which is I find quite interesting, is to ask people for their willingness to pay at the end of the survey. Before the feedback, we say, would you be interested in learning the truth about all these things we asked you about, the share of immigrants, the unemployment, etc. Note that these things are not so easy to find online. Would you like to know? Uh, and then people are, we give them a random amount. Would you like to pay $1, $5, $10, $20? Uh, and people have to say yes or no. If they say yes, they see the info. We also ask them, are you surprised, by the way, uh, afterwards? Um, and so we can see who's willing to pay, who's not. So of course, the more you increase the amount that they have to pay, the less they pay. So that works. But what we can say is, let's create a dummy. That's the first column. A, a dummy for the willingness to pay. Are you willing to pay? Con controlling for the amount you have to pay. Uh, let's regress it on all your characteristics and let's regress it on a misperception index, you know, how wrong you are in general about immigrants. What you can see is that people who are more wrong are less willing to pay for the information. You can interpret this in several ways, uh, you know, and by, this is controlling for the income of the respondent, for political views, etc. So it's in addition, the pure misperception. So one interpretation that psychologists could give would be that you're more confident um, in your in your findings. The less willing to pay you are, the more confident you are in your own knowledge. So here it says that people who are more wrong may be more confident in their knowledge too. Um, or it may be a lack of interest to learn, which is maybe driving the misperception in the first place, of course. So many possible explanations, but that correlation is there. Note also that people on the, on the right are less willing to pay for the information. Again, controlling for income, controlling for many other things, just being like, I call it Republican because... Uh, this is mostly done in the US, uh, are less willing to pay to learn the truth about immigrants. And then you can see the other correlations. If you don't have college, you're also less willing to pay, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then are people surprised? Well, here, conditional on paying. So now we filtered out the fact that some people don't want to pay. Conditional on paying, the more wrong you were, the more surprised you are by the results, which makes sense. Okay. So there's the difference between these two columns. Okay. Good. Mm. All right, so now I'm going to switch to the um, experimental findings about the um, perceptions and redistribution. So remember that we have three different types of treatments. The first is just a priming or salience treatment, which is just let's invert the order of the questions uh, between immigration and redistribution. Does it have any impact? Does it show any effect? Okay, so remember the immigration block is all these misperceptions, or perception questions I showed you, plus there's actually questions about immigration policy, which I can I, I will show you too. And then the second is the bigger distribution block uh, with all the tax questions, income support questions, how to spend the budget, role of government, etc. Okay, so let's look at the table. Um, I put in red what you can focus on here because I have all the other treatment effects too, but I'll show them later. So in the first column is just an immigration support index, which is taking together all the immigration policy questions. Are you happy that immigrants get citizenship sooner? Should there be more immigrants? Should they get benefits, etc.? Obviously, the part where you invert the order of the questions, it makes no sense to look at the uh, 
immigration support since that's part of what's being uh, what's being randomized. So it makes no sense to look at the effect. And by the way, there is no effect, but we don't expect otherwise to just show the immigration questions first on immigration questions. And then there's the effect on the top tax rate, the tax rate that you would like to set on the top 1%, uh, the tax rate you would like to set on the bottom 50%, a social budget, basically, by that I mean all the social insurance spending. Um, is inequality a serious problem? And do you donate more to charities or not? So kind of the, the private way of redistributing. And you can see that the effects are consistently negative on when it comes to tax policy. Uh, is inequality serious on whether you donate? There's not much effect on social spending. So uh, it's mostly going through the redistribution through taxes, progressive taxes. You don't you don't want to really be taxed to benefit immigrants, it seems, uh, or you would like less progressive taxes when there are more immigrants. The the social spending, it's quite noisy, uh, but it could just be that people don't don't think about it as much as how much is going to get taken out of my pocket uh, and how, how progressive will the system be. And there's an effect even on the donation, which, you know, remember, it has nothing to do with immigrants. These are just private charities, and this is a real outcome in the sense that it truly will come out of people's pockets if they win the lottery and they have to commit to it. Okay.